OK, so we're going to solve one Lagrange problem. So the example is find the closest points uh, on the parabola y is x squared to the point 0, 3. Okay, and this is using the method of Lagrange multipliers. The closest points on the parabola y is x squared to the point 0, 3 using the method of Lagrange multipliers. Okay, <coughs> so let's draw a picture so everyone really understands what it is that's being asked. Okay, so then that parabola given is the standard parabola, right? It opens up, it goes through the origin, <coughs> like so. Up to my ability to draw. Now let's try that again. That's not, not really better. Okay, that's fine. So, <coughs> So here's the point, 0, 3. So I want to find, you know, we're instructed to find the closest points on the parabola to the point 0, 3. So does everyone understand the question, what's being asked? Okay, so then now we need to turn this into uh, the method of Lagrange multipliers. So then in order, in order to do that, you'll recall that we need two functions that we've been calling f and g. So what is g? Not, not what is its formula, but what is, what is it specifying? The constraint, right? The constraint. So what's the constraint here? The point has to be where? Can it be anywhere? The points I'm trying to find, can they just be anywhere at all? No, they have to be on the parabola. Right, so, you know, this, you know, if you were to go through this exercise and then say, here it is, right, that's the closest point, right, that, that wouldn't make any sense. First off, it's not all that close. Second off, second off, it's not even on the parabola. So does everybody see that the constraint is that the points that you tell me must be on the parabola? Okay, so then let's write that down. The constraint... is, I will say, taking this formula, y is x squared, I'll say that it is the function g of x and y is equal to y minus x squared, but now I need to add one more condition to make it constrained, and what is that condition? That g has to be zero, right? That g has to be zero. So this is, this is the way to mathematically encode that the points that we find, they must be on the parabola. Okay, <coughs> now, what is, the, what is the objective? What is it that we're trying to minimize or maximize or whatever? Distance, right, distance. So we need some function that plays surrogate with the distance. Okay, so then in particular, <coughs> you know, maybe in the course of our analysis we'll say, well, I'll try, I'll try this point right here. So this is some point x, y. Okay, and then what we want to, what we're trying to minimize is the length of this line, right? The distance between the point x, y and the point 0, 3. We're trying to minimize that because if we were to minimize that distance, that would tell us where the closest points are. So now, imagine for a moment that we have this point x, y, and now I can move it sort of freely along this parabola. Where do you think the closest points are going to be? Do you think I should take this green point and start moving it up the parabola, you know, far that way? Would that be a good strategy? No, 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 th not that way, right? Probably not that way. But if I was to move it down a little bit, you can see just with your eyeballs that the, the distance would be decreasing. Right, so that's good. Okay. 
And then if I was to keep going this way, you know, then the distance would be increasing really, really far. So then at least according to my eye, I'm not sure yet, but according to my eye, I think the minimum distance is going to be like maybe right here. You know, maybe. But <coughs> I don't know yet. But if there is one there, if there is a point of minimum distance right there, where else must there also be? A symmetric one on the other side. So can, it, can you see that probably just by looking at the picture, we should expect the minimal points to come in, in a pair. So can you see that? OK. <laughs> just imagine that I drew it right. <laughs> They're supposed to be. You know what? The trick is really is to draw really fat points. You know? <laughs> that's the trick. Because then no one can say that, no, that's not quite symmetric. OK, they're symmetric. OK. <coughs> so we need to come up with the objective function. So then I'll keep with the strategy of calling this f of x and y. But first, let's compute the distance. Right? So then the distance, I'll just call it d. I'll call this thing d. So how do you compute the distance between two points? With the distance formula, good, OK. So then this will be the square root of uh, x minus 0 squared plus y minus 3 squared. OK, so then <coughs> distance is equal to x squared plus y minus 3 squared. Okay, so does everybody see that for any value of x and y, that's the distance to the point 0, 3. So then now, you might think that we could minimize the distance, but now I'm going to pull a standard mathematician trick and say that, yeah, we could minimize the distance, and that would be a perfectly acceptable thing to do, but it's going to be easier to minimize the distance squared. Right? So I'm going to take this distance and square it, because what it's going to turn out is that the computations, right, just the algebraic and calculus computations required will simply be easier if we minimize the distance squared instead of the distance itself. Okay, so then what we're going to do is we're going to minimize d squared. So then I'm going to call this function d squared f of x and y is x squared plus y minus 3 squared. Right, that's that's equal to d squared. <coughs> okay, so any question about how we arrived at this position? So now we have a constraint. The constraint is that it must be on the parabola. And now we have an objective function, that which we're saying is going to be the distance squared. We can see that we want to minimize it. Okay, so any questions about how we got to this position? So now, <coughs> now, we will find the critical points of the Lagrange system. Of the Lagrange system. That is to say, we're going to solve this system of equations. We're going to solve that the gradient of f of x and y is equal to a multiple of the gradient of g of x and y. And also, so then what does this first equation say? Remind me. Geometrically, what is this saying? Something about the gradients. The gradients are what? Parallel, right? The gradients are parallel. In particular, what is really more important, it's not, I mean, that's a, it's a true statement and it's meaningful that the gradients are parallel, but better, better for you to understand is that the iso, how are the isosurfaces of the gradient and the constraint related? They are tangent to each other, right? The, the isosurfaces of the objective function are tangent to the isosurfaces of the uh, constraint function. Okay. Another way to say that is that their gradients are parallel. But not only, must their, not only must the gradients be parallel, what must also be true? What must also be true? You know, and, and it has to do with this. Would this be would this be a legitimate point? What if the gradients are parallel there? Why is this not a legitimate point? 
it doesn't satisfy the constraint. Right? That's not a legitimate point because it doesn't satisfy the constraint. So we need to s solve this equation that the gradients are parallel and also <coughs> that the constraint is satisfied. So does everybody remember this from Tuesday? <coughs> I hope so. So then let's compute these things. Okay, the gradient of f. The gradient of f is 2x in the first component and 2y minus 3 in the second component. The gradient of g is <coughs> negative 2x in the first component and 1 in the second component. So altogether that means we need to solve this system that 2x is equal to <coughs> lambda multiplied by negative 2x. 2y minus 6 is equal to uh, what? Lambda times 1. And also that the constraint must be satisfied and the constraint is that y is x squared. So can everybody see that we boiled down the question to the solution to these three equations? Okay, yes? Okay. <coughs> so, now, these equations, how many variables are there in these equations? Three, right? There is x, there is y, and there is also lambda. Okay, now these equations, these equations are not linear. So anytime you're solving nonlinear equations by hand, which is what we're about to do, there, I just have unfortunate news for you. There's really no systematic way to go through, do, go through it. You just have to be very careful. So then, an example of being very careful is, let's look at the first equation. 2x is equal to negative lambda multiplied by 2x. And many students will tell me that, well, the solution to this equation is lambda is negative 1. But that's not the only solution to this equation. Yeah, right? X could be 0. X could be 0. So then typically the best way to go about doing this is to m move all of the terms to one side so that you get something like 2x uh, uh, 2x plus lambda multiplied by 2x is 0. So now on the left-hand side, you can see there's a common term of 2x. So I'll say that's 2x is equal to 1 plus lambda. So there are two possible solutions. Right? One solution is that x is 0. Another solution is that lambda is negative 1. Okay, so then in my experience as an instructor, Many students just want to take this and say, uh, well, I'll divide both sides by 2x and get that 1 is equal to negative lambda, so that lambda is negative 1. So what's wrong with dividing both sides by 2x? Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the action, but what, why can you not do that? Because you didn't guarantee that x was non-zero. You just divided by zero, universe destroyed, it's over, right? <laughs> it's all over. Okay, so then you need to be very careful about this. So any question about the solution to the first equation? So now we have two possibilities. <coughs> okay, we have to take them one at a time. So in the case that x is zero, We'll, we'll start with that possibility. If x is 0, <coughs> then we can see from the next equation, from the last equation, y is x squared. This implies that y is what? This implies that y is 0. Okay, so if x is 0, then y is 0. And we can also, it's not necessary, but if we needed to, we could figure out what lambda is. That would tell us that lambda is what? Negative 6. Okay, so that's the first possibility, is that x is 0, y is 0, and lambda is negative 6. Okay, so does everybody see that that's a possibility? Okay, what is the other possibility? Instead of starting with x is 0, we could start with what? Lambda is negative 1. Okay, we'll take that po possibility. So, if lambda is negative 1, 
then now we can use this information and plug it into the second equation. We can plug it into the second equation. So first off, notice that if lambda is negative 1, this implies that x is not 0, right? because we already, we already handled that case previously. Kay. Because if x is 0, then lambda is negative 6. <coughs> So then, uh, where was I? Ah, yes, the second, uh, no, the third equation. Okay, so we have 2y minus 6 uh, is equal to negative 1. Okay, because we said lambda was negative 1, so now we can solve for y. We get, what, 2y is equal to 5? Is it 5? So that y is 5 halves. Okay, so does everybody see how we obtained y is 5 halves? So now how do you figure out what x is? Yeah, use the last equation. So then now we can use that y is x squared, so that we have that x squared is 5 halves. So there are two solutions. x is negative the square root of 5 halves, or x is positive the square root of 5 halves. OK, so then now. In the first case, we determined that one of the solutions was xy equal to 0, 0. So what are the solutions in this case? Yes, negative uh, square root of 5 halves. And then, what did we say? 5 halves. And then positive square root of 5 halves, 5 halves. Okay, so someone tell me why it makes sense that we got these two here. Why do we get these two different ones? Yeah, right? Look up at the drawing. Didn't we, didn't we look at the drawing already and say that we're probably going to get symmetric points? Yeah, so then, now, what about the zero, zero point? Where was that? <laughs> it's at the origin, right. So then it's, uh, it's like right here. So we have three points to consider right, according to the method of Lagrange multipliers, and we need to figure out, well, which one is the least? Which one is the least? So how do we, how do we do that? Ah, we plug it back in. Okay, good. Okay, so we plug them back into the objective. So the objective evaluated at 0, 0, so I'll just copy the objective function right here so we can look at it. What was it? It was x squared plus y minus 3 squared? Yes. Okay, so then evaluated at 0, 0, well that's 1 plus, uh, what, 9? Uh, excuse me, 0 plus 9, so the distance squared is 9. Okay, so then at the next point, um, negative the square root of 5 halves, 5 halves. That is, well, negative five, the square root of 5 halves squared. So the negative goes away and the square root goes away, so that's 5 halves. And then plus uh, 5 halves minus 3 squared. So 5 halves minus 6 halves is negative 1 halves. You square that, so that's positive one-fourth. So this is five-halves plus one-fourth. So this is ten-fourths plus one-fourth is eleven-fourths. Okay, so any question about how we got to here? So then there's probably not going to be a big surprise when I say that the other point, square root of five-halves, 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 is also at eleven-fourths. unless I made an arith arithmetic mistake. So 11 fourths uh, and 9, this is, so 9 is 36 fourths, just so that we can compare these two. So what is it that we were trying to do? Find a minimum, right, a minimum. Of these three numbers, which one is the smallest? The last two, right? And they're the same distance. So the answer is that <coughs> the conclusion is that the minimum distance is 11 fourths and it occurs at 
plus or minus the square root of 5 halves, 5 halves. Okay, so any question about this problem? So, s yes? Ah, so, so it's a good, it's a good question. So, so really, if you took my calculus class last semester, then I solved a, I might, I might have solved this question exactly, <laughs> but I didn't use uh, the method of Lagrange multiplier. So his question was, can can we use the calculus one way? And the answer is no. But but why is the answer? Why can you not? <laughs> the answer the answer of why you are not allowed to do that is because it says using the method of Lagrange multipliers. I have no objection whatsoever to you verifying <laughs> with c the calculus one way. Yes? Ah, yeah, good. That's a good point. The minimum distance squared is this. So really, what would the minimum distance be? The square root of 11 fourths. Yeah, good. Okay, so then we found those three points, right? Notice, you know, this one, this one is, the distance squared is far away. So what happened here, in a sense? Have a look at the picture and see what happens. Someone explain to me what the meaning of our computation is geometrically, right? Because all of this stuff, right, if you just sort of, you know, zoom out and look at all that computation right there, that's sort of intimidating to look at, okay. What does that mean with respect to this picture? The fact that we found three points and one of them was, two of them had the same distance, one of them was farther away. Hmm. So what it means is if I take this green point and I move it along the parabola, so then I think we can all agree, if I move it upward along the parabola, the distance just increases. It just keeps getting bigger as if I'm moving it up. Okay, so if I start from up here and I'm moving it down, the distance is decreasing, 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 and then this is the closest it ever gets. So now from this point, the distance starts increasing, 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 and now, on this section of the parabola, this is the farthest away it gets. And then, you continue, and the distance is decreasing, 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 and then this is the closest it gets, and then now the distance increases, 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 all the way to infinity. Okay, so does everybody see geometrically how, what's happening in this question? Okay, wonderful. So any questions before we go on to something new? <coughs> the method of Lagrange multiplier is wonderful. Okay, so now we're in section 14.1. <coughs> so I have some good news. Right, the good news is that, you know, we are mostly finished with the differential point of view of functions of several variables. So, this is a calculus class, so it just stands to reason if I just said that we're mostly finished with the differential point of view, then what are we moving on to? The integral point of view, right? The integral point of view. So we're going to start integrating things, computing antiderivatives and things like this. So chapter 14 is called multiple integration, and section 14.1 is called iterated integrals. Okay, so <coughs> I'd like to start out with the simplest possible example. So how about this? This is not a calculus uh, two, prob two problem, it's just a calculus one problem. So how about this? Not a difficult question. So what is it? Yep, x squared over 2 plus c. Okay, now someone explain to me what this plus C means. <coughs> right, so, so it's constant, but specifically it's constant with respect to X. Right, it's constant with respect to X. Right, maybe it's not constant with respect to uh, Q or banana, but it has to be constant with respect to x, 
Okay, that's the, the requirement. So everybody remember this kind of thing. Okay, so another thing from Calculus 1 that we wanted to get across to you was, was something like this, and that is um, if, if the derivative of big F of X is little f of X. Right, so then this is the forward way, the differential way to say this sentence, the derivative of big F is little f. Okay, and then at about this position in the semester in Calculus 1, we said, but this mathematical sentence can be said in another way. It can be said like this. You could say, okay, instead of saying the derivative of big F is little f, you could say, the antiderivative of little f is big F plus a constant. Okay, so this sort of kind of tells you how to go backwards and forwards between derivatives and antiderivatives. So, the most specific statement that we could give you is the fundamental theorem of calculus, which paradoxically the book calls the second fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm not really sure where the author is coming from on that point of view. But, the most <coughs> specific statement we could tell you of the relationship between differentiation, anti-differentiation, and integration is this statement. So what that tells you is that <coughs> the derivative operation and the integral operation from 0 to x okay, are inverses of each other in the same sense that if, I, if, if, I give you, if you give me a number a, your favorite number, and then I multiply it by 2, and then I divide it by 2, that's the same as having done nothing at all. Okay, that's the same as having done nothing at all. So this is saying that if you give me your favorite function, f, and it satisfies certain requirements, like for example, it could be continuous, if you give me your favorite continuous function and then I compute this integral operation from 0 to x with respect to t dt and then differentiate with respect to x, then that's the same as having done nothing at all, right? You get f back. Okay, so we have to sort of be careful about this, this kind of thing and we want to know, is there something like this for calculus 2? And the answer is... Well, the answer is complicated, so let's see what's going on here. <coughs> let's start out with an example. So what if I give you that f of x and y, f of x and y is equal to, how about, 3x to the 5 plus, I don't know, y squared. Okay, so then now please compute for me the x partial. So what's the x partial? 15x to the 4. Okay, great. So I computed a derivative. Now let's compute an antiderivative. So how about let's compute the antiderivative of the x partial dx. Okay, which is to say the antiderivative of 15x to the 4 dx, right, which will be uh, 3x to the 5. And now I'm going to write something that is strictly, sp that is not correct, and I want you to tell me why it's not correct. Plus c. Sorry? So this is this is maybe not entirely incorrect, but this I would I would probably grade this incorrectly, this response. So in particular, this is an antiderivative with respect to x. So that constant has to be constant with respect to x. But it's a perfectly legitimate thing for it to be a function of y. So it's not it's three x to the fifth plus some function which is constant with respect to x but may depend on y. So in particular, having a look and just comparing these two, <coughs> you 
you should be able to tell me exactly what that function of y is. What is it? y squared, right? If I wanted to fully recover f from its x partial. Okay, so then the constants of integration are now going to be constant with respect to the one variable you were computing antiderivative with respect to, but it may depend on all of the others. Okay, so does everybody see what's happening? <coughs> okay. <coughs> so now let's continue with this mind bending experience. So, for example, how about we're going to compute an integral now? So, how about the integral of 3x squared plus, uh, I don't know, xy plus 4 dx? And this is going to be from. Uh, now, this is the way the book will write it. From, I'll say, uh, I don't know, y to y squared. Okay, so then I typically don't write it this way. Okay, and the reason why, why is because it becomes confusing to look at what is going on. So then we're going to perform this integration of this expression with respect to x, and then I have these limits. So something is equal to y. What is equal to y? x, right? This is from x is equal to y to x is equal to y squared. Okay, so then the red parts that I've just written, the author basically never writes. I'm not really sure why he doesn't. I think it would be much more clear if he did. Okay, so then now we'll proceed from here. <coughs> okay, so then we're supposed to compute the antiderivative of this with respect to x, assuming that y is a constant. So then what is the antiderivative of 3x squared? It's x cubed. Okay, now here's something interesting. What's the antiderivative of xy with respect to x? x squared y over 2. Okay, now why is it x squared y over 2? Because y is a constant, right? y is just a constant. Okay, so you have to be able to look at this and, you know, have the, <laughs> have the understanding that in this context, y is just constant. So this is x squared over 2 multiplied by y because that was just a constant, and then plus 4x. Okay, and then this is evaluated, evaluated from x is equal to y to x is equal to y squared. Okay, so then now what are we supposed to do? Yeah, now we start plugging in, right? So then, so then this will be x cubed. I'm supposed to replace x with y squared. So that will be y squared cubed plus y squared squared over 2y plus 4y squared. Okay, then minus. <coughs> y cubed plus y squared over 2y plus 4y. Okay, and then you can imagine that I could further request, I want you to simplify this as much as possible, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so does everybody understand this, this example? Okay, <coughs> so now let's do another example. So now we're going to do something, and I'm just going to introduce this notation <coughs> so in an example so that you see it for the first time. So then I'm going to say the integral from 1 to 2, and then the integral from 1 to x of 2x squared y to the negative 2 then plus 2y and then dy dx okay so this is how the author wants to write it so i would say that really you shouldn't you shouldn't write it this way <coughs> okay so first off what you should do is you should figure out what 
these limits are. So then this is from something is 1 to something is 2. From what is 1 to what is 2. What is the something? It's x. Right, it's x because that it is the x is the outermost one. Right, so it is from x is 1 to x is 2. Okay, then then this is from something is 1 to something is x. From from what is 1? y is 1 to y is x. Okay, finally, the meaning of this, the meaning of this uh, math sentence here is that this is from x is 1 to x is 2. And from y is 1 to y is x. 2x squared y to the negative 2 plus 2y dy dx. Okay, so what that means is you just close your eyes and, you know, according to the rules of parentheses and things like this, you just close your eyes and you ignore everything that's outside of the parentheses for a moment. Okay, and then look at what is inside of the parentheses. Well, that's just a calculus one antiderivative, integral. So then let's compute it in the calculus one way. So from x is 1 to x is 2, just copying that part. Okay, so then now we're computing antiderivative with respect to which symbol? Y. So then 2x squared, what is, what's true about 2x squared in this context? It's a constant. So then that's just a constant 2x squared. And then the antiderivative of y to the negative 2 is uh, y to the negative 1 divided by negative 1. So I'll say negative 1 over y. And then plus the antiderivative of 2y with respect to y is y squared. Okay, then this has to be evaluated from y is 1 to y is x. Does everybody see how we arrived at this juncture? <coughs> All right. So then x is 1 to x is 2. Okay, so then we'll get 2x squared multiplied by negative 1 over x plus x squared. Okay, that's what you get if you plug in x. And then minus <coughs> what we get if we plug in y is 1. So we get 2x squared uh, multiplied by negative 1 multiplied uh, plus 1, like so. Okay, so inside of the square parentheses, I would say that if, if all you were doing was that first integral, you should stop there and not worry about performing any algebraic simplifications. But we don't, we're, this is not where we're stopping, so you should, you should algebraically simplify the stuff in the square parentheses. So x is 1 to x is 2. <coughs> okay, so then this is 2x squared over x, so one of those x's will cancel, so this is negative 2x, and then plus x squared, and then minus negative 2x squared, so plus 2x squared, and then minus 1. And one more step here. So this is equal to so then 3x squared minus 2x minus 1 dx. Okay, so does everybody see how we arrived here? So now this is again. This is just a calculus 1 integral. Okay, so we do it again. Okay, so then x cubed minus x squared minus x. And then this is evaluated from x is 1 to x is 2. Uh, that's not right, is it? No, it is right. Okay, that's right. Okay, so then this will be what? 8 minus 4 minus 2 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. So 8 minus 6 is 2. And then 1 minus 0 minus 1, so then plus 1. So the answer is 3.
Wonderful. Isn't that great? You did all that work for three. <laughs> I'm really excited about that. Okay, but any question about this? So that now, you know, we did this procedure. Let's sort of zoom out and have a look at it, right? right we did that nice long procedure. So someone tell me why this procedure is called iterated integrals. Yeah, because we first did one integral and then and then we did another integral, right? So then I'm sure that you can see that I've just made gave you a question where you had to do an integral, one integral and then another. So I made you do two in a row. So can you see that I can make you do arbitrarily many of these in a row? Right? I could make you do 10, 15, a million. Right? Not really, right? I'm not really going to do that. I'm just saying it's possible. But I could iterate this as much as I wanted. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, <coughs> so then now, this is like a purely linguistic procedure we just went through, right? These were all just math sentences. What does this have to do with geometry at all? Right, that's the question that I had the first time I, I went through this. <coughs> so then let's try and connect it. <coughs> so, <coughs> in order to make that connection, uh, we need to make a remark. Okay, and these are called uh, simple regions. <coughs> okay, so then there's two kinds of simple regions, horizontally simple and vertically simple. Okay. So let's say that we start out with these two. Oh wait, I didn't want this okay, I didn't want that horizontal black line. I just want two vertical blue lines. Okay, so that this is some value x is a and this is x is b. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw <coughs> some nice hat that goes on the top here. So something like this. Very nice. This will be y is, uh, say, g of x. Okay, and some other very nice uh, hat, or I guess shoes, something like this. This is some other function, y is h of x. Okay. So then now, this, these four graphs, uh, they bound an area, right, this area, and you can probably agree with me when I tell you that, well, that's not a named shape, right? That's not like a rectangle or a, or a circle or whatever, but nevertheless, it's a shape, and so it has an area, and so we could talk about it, right, the area that is. Okay, so then before we talk about it, I want to show you that there's another thing that I could have done just as well. I could say that, uh, okay, instead of having vertical lines, I could make uh, horizontal lines. And then I could say, okay, I'm going to make some nice left side. This will be some function x is... Uh, something, I already used H and G, so I guess I should use what else? F, but if I use F, then what else will I use? F, G, H, I. I is no good. We use I for too many other things. How about just P and Q? Okay, so P of Y. Oh, wait, that won't work because that's not a function. Okay, so then, okay, so like this, X is Q of Y. Okay, so then now, <coughs> you know, you're not accustomed, you know, if you turn your head to the side, then, then it's probably less psychologically jarring. But, you know, this is a, this is, this curve is a function of y. It's a function of y, and this other curve is also a function of y. Okay, so if I was to just take this and turn it 90 degrees, then, then you would be looking at it in the normal way. Okay, so then similarly, this, 
This is not a named shape, but nevertheless it has an area. Right? And so that we could talk about it. So then when we were talking about shapes, you know, maybe not necessarily as complex as these, but like these in calculus one, how was it that we got at their areas? With integrals, right? With integrals. And that's how we're going to do it here as well. Okay, so then this is, you know, y is uh, d, and this is y is c. Okay, so these two different shapes, they are said to be simple shapes. They're simple shapes because they are bounded on two sides by straight lines, right? So the first shape is bounded on left and right by the vertical lines x is a and x is b. And the second shape is bounded above and below by the horizontal lines y is c and y is d. Okay, so then specifically, <coughs> specifically, and I'll have to be very careful because I always forget which one is called which. Okay. So vertically simple. So then the first one, this one is said to be vertically simple. Okay, so then it's vertically simple because it can be decomposed, it can be decomposed into the infinite summation of infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles, which are vertically oriented. That is to say, like so. Uh, let's see, pink? Pink would be all right. right. This kind of thing. Because if I take this, you know, if I take this rectangle and I move it, <laughs> and I move it side to side and keep, and I keep it the appropriate height, then I can push it all the way to, the, to this thing, and you know, it'll agree, right? I won't have to worry about it. Whereas I can't use horizontal rectangles to do the same thing because then they won't match up. Okay, so this is a vertical rectangle, so this is called vertically simple. So then now, tell me, use your imagination, what do you think this one's going to be called? Horizontally simple, right? horizontally simple and so this one this one's called vertically simple because you can use vertical rectangles in the calculus sense so why is this one called horizontally simple <laughs> because you can use horizontal rectangles okay so then let's draw a horizontal rectangle So I hope everyone remembers the calculus one argument where we said, okay, we're going to decompose a shape into infinitely many infinitesimal rectangles and continuously sum them, and this thing is called an integral. Okay, <coughs> so then now, I'll write the precise mathematical legal definition of what's going on here. So if we are given <coughs> a region... bounded by x is a, x is b, and uh, h of x is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to g of x, and this is with continuous h of x and g of x. So given a region that's bounded on left and right by A and B, and bounded above and below by H and G, and H and G are both continuous, then it is a fact that we can compute the area of this. So then one way you could compute the area of this is that in Calculus 1 we said that, okay, we didn't talk about this kind of shape where you're bounded above and below by a function. We talked about a shape where you're just about bounded above. So I could, I could decompose this into two shapes, which is both of which are bounded above, and then subtract. Okay, and then we showed in Calculus 1 that if the function is continuous, then it's a fact that you can compute the area. So rather than get into all the really fine technical details, I'll just tell you that this is a perfectly legitimate thing that I'm seeing here. Okay, so then vertically simple given a region, blah, 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 then the area is 
given by this iterated integral from x is a to x is b and then from y is what do you think? Not g, h of x. <laughs> okay, but rather, other than process of elimination, <laughs> how did you? Uh, what what makes h of x be the right choice? Because that's the lower one. That's where you start, right? H of x to y is g of x. Okay, of now this is this is the interesting question is what are we supposed to be integrating here? Hmm. Well, the answer is dy dx. That's it. Okay, <coughs> and we'll sh I'll show you why that's the case in just a moment. So similarly. <coughs> If you have a similar statement to above, except you swap the roles of x and y and otherwise replace the symbols properly, then the area is also an iterated integral. Okay, so then someone tell me, what should the limits be for this one? Okay, so from y is c to y is d is the exterior integral. Okay, what about the interior? x is p to y is q. Uh, excuse me. x is p... Oop. Ah, getting so confused. x is p of y to x is q of y. Okay, now what are we supposed to be integrating? dx dy. Okay. Great. Yes? Yes? They are all functions. No, they must be functions. It must be functions. Okay, so then the reason why this is the case is because if I copy this down here for just a minute here. Isn't that cool? Okay, so then <coughs> if I take this, let's just go ahead and compute the antiderivative real quick. So this interior integral, this is antiderivative with respect to which symbol? With respect to y. Okay, so then what is the antiderivative of 1 dy? Y. y. Okay, so then this is, this is the integral from x is a to x is b of y evaluated from y is h of x to y is g of x dx, right? So I took care of the y antiderivative. So now I need to do this and say that this is, well, this is the integral from x is a to x is b of, now what do I get when I perform the substitution? g of x minus h of x dx. And now this is the calculus one formulation of the problem. Do you remember this now? So have a look. Do you remember that in Calculus 1, what we did is we said that, well, this, this is the height of a rectangle, and this is the width of a rectangle. So the differential area, the infinitesimal area, is dA is equal to gx minus h of x dx. So that's the area of this vertical rectangle, right? The area of this thing is dA. So do you remember that from Calculus 1? So then a similar procedure that, you know, that to this shows you why this formula is also correct. But the purpose of writing this here is so that you have the jargon now horizontally simple, vertically simple, and you can uh, look and see how it's related to these iterated integrals. So any question about this? Okay. So then, now, <coughs> let's work on 
doing some of these. <coughs> so for example, I want you to consider the following iterated integral. So the book writes it as so, from 0 to 2, and then from uh, y squared to 4. of dx dy. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is I want you to correct the notation and write the limits properly. So then this is supposed to be what? y is 0 to y is 2 and this is x is y squared to x is 4. Okay, so now that that is complete <laughs> The first thing I want you to do is I want you to sketch the area indicated by this integral. think about this for a minute. So between y is 0 and y is 2. So I've drawn an axis here. <coughs> this is y is 0. Right? Where is y is 2? A little bit, little bit up, right? So then I'll say, oops, I'll say for the purposes of argument, it's right here. Okay, great. So now uh, x is 4. So where is x is 4? What kind of what kind of graph is x is 4 anyway? Vertical. Vertical line, good. So then it's something like this. Okay, now we have this other graph. Uh, x is y squared. Now what is x is y squared? What is it? It's a parabola, right? It's a parabola. In which direction does it open? To the right. Okay, so x is y squared. That's a parabola. It looks something like this. So first off, notice that this intersection, x is y squared. Does x is y squared go through that intersection? x is y squared? Is 4 equal to 2 squared? Yeah, okay, good. So then it goes right here. Oh. So it goes through there. What's another point that's on that parabola? Zero, zero. Right, and then this point is on it as well, down here. Okay, so I'm going to try and eyeball it here. Well, that was pretty good. Let's see if I can, if I can reproduce it. Up, oh, up. Oh. Pretty good. Okay. <coughs> so. So. We sketched all the all the limits, right? We sketched y is 0, y is 2. Uh, we sketched x is 4 and x is y squared. What is What are we talking about? What area is being referred to? Hmm. Let's think about it for a minute. So first off, if we look at it in the context of the previous remarks, notice, notice that because we're, we are integrating between two constants, y constants, y is 0 and y is 2, that means that this, this is a simple region. Now, is it horizontally simple or is it vertically simple? Okay, so which one is it? Horizontally simple or vertically simple? So let's take a look. We, we're doing dx dy. dx dy, so have a look. Which one is dx dy? Horizontally simple, right? So what kind of rectangles are we fitting in here? Horizontal rectangles. Right, so this is, because we're using dx dy, this is telling us that we're doing this horizontally. 
Okay. So we're doing it horizontally. So then now, in my experience, students say, give me about 50-50 at this point in the class. Well, they'll say, I think it's this area. And then about the other 50% will say, well, I think it's this area. So then let's try and figure out which one it should be. So we're doing horizontal rectangles. Horizontal rectangles. So let's think. Where are we supposed to start a horizontal rectangle? So between x is y squared and between x is 4. So let's look. What if I was to do this horizontal rectangle right here? Okay, and then I just am making them overlap so that you can see them. Okay, they wouldn't really overlap in reality. Okay, so then what would that be? That would be from x is 0 to x is y squared. Are we going from x is 0 to x is y squared? Ah, so this isn't it. It's not this one. It's not this one. So then, let's draw uh, in the other region. I use gray. Well, I need another color now. Okay, black will be fine. Okay, so then... So then, how about this rectangle? Right, so then this rectangle starts at x is y squared and stops at x is 4. So can you see that this, ah, this is the one we're talking about. So we're talking about the orange region. Okay, so can everybody see that the orange region is the one we're talking about? Okay, good. So now, now, let's go ahead and compute this iterated integral. Okay, let's, let's compute it. But in fact, because I want to rush through this, maybe I'll just tell you what it is. <laughs> and you can believe me. Okay, so then dx dy. Like so. If you do this very carefully, then you will get 16 over 3. Okay, so you perform that computation very carefully. You get 16 over 3. What is the meaning of that number 16 over 3? is the area of the orange region. Okay, is the area of the orange region. So now, now we do something that is mind-bending. Okay, and the thing we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, you get 16 over 3 if you integrate it horizontally. What do you get if you integrate it vertically? You better get the same thing, right? Right, so sort of like I take this, I measure its area. How much area does it have? Okay, 16 over 3, and then I turn it a little bit. Now how much area does it have? Well, it better still have 16 over 3, right? That's one of the requirements, sort of, that we have, you know, as humans, <laughs> right? Better still have the same area. Okay, so then, let's take this area. Let's take this area and decompose it, instead of into infinitely many infinitesimal horizontally oriented rectangles, we'll decompose it into infinitely many infinitesimal vertically oriented rectangles. Okay, and then compute the integral in that fashion. So then, <coughs> if I take that same image, and now I say I want you to do it vertically, then, <coughs> I need to select even another color now, so how about uh, blue, <laughs> I guess. <coughs> so I need vertical rectangles, and where should they be, right? Not in this pink region, but in the orange region. The orange region is where they need to be. So then, we'll be integrating vertical rectangles. So now what we need to do in order to write the limits, in order to write the integral properly, we need to determine the limits. So then now, 
This rectangle, you can sort of imagine that I'm shifting it left and right. I'm shifting it left and right through this region. So what is the furthest left that I need to take it? I mean, should it be over here? Should I, do I need to take the blue rectangle over here? No, not over here, because then it would, it would cease to be in the region. I don't need to take it over here. It needs to be here. Okay, so what is the furthest left it needs to go? To x is 0, right? So then, it's 0 less than or equal to x, and then that has to be less than or equal to... So now, what is the furthest right that I need to take this? To x is 4, right? I don't need to take it all the way over here to x is 6. x is 6 is too far. I don't, it doesn't need to be over there. Okay, so now let's say that we have selected a particular x value. That is to say that I've chosen this rectangle, right, to be at this position, left and right. So now, where does this start, right? Am I integrating down here? No, not down here, because this, this stuff down here is not in the region, right? So I'm not integrating, not integrating, not integrating, not integrating, and then I start here at y is what? Zero. Right, so zero less than or equal to y less than or equal to. And then I integrate, 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 and then stop here at y is what? The square root of x. At y is the square root of x. Right, not, I don't need to go any further up here. So does everybody see that these are the new boundaries? Okay, now, this, right, 0 is a continuous function, the square root of x is a continuous function, which means this is a perfectly legitimate thing to say that this is now a uh, vertically simple region. So I can say that you should be able to write down the new integral, the new iterated integral, so please write it down. So from x is 0 to x is 4, and then from y is 0 to y is the square root of x, and now what am I supposed to be integrating? <coughs> dy dx. Okay? So now, I want to write these side by side just so you can see them, so then now that... So, I won't... We're not going to take the time to compute it, but what do you suppose you will get if you, if you carry this out? 16 over 3. Good. So then now, this, right, oops, this was the, the integral we did second, and this one was the integral we did first. And I want you to look at them. Okay. And compare. So then, these two integrals encode the area of the same region, right? but one of them is integrated with, essentially, in a horizontal fashion, and then one of them is integrated in a vertical fashion. So then, doing this, switching the order of integration, that's called switching the order, or switching the limits. Okay, now, one thing I'd like to point out is that, unfortunately, because students don't come to class or don't read carefully or whatever, you know, the instructions will sway, say, switch the order of integration. Okay, so then I gave you this one, and I wanted you to do this one. So I could say, here's this one, I want you to give me this one, and I'll say, here's this integral, I want you to switch the order of integration. All the time, and I mean every time I have ever asked this question, some student will simply just write this. They will, you know, I'll say, take this one and switch the order of integration. And then they'll write this. They'll say, well, it's this, isn't it? <laughs> or something like this. Right, so that all that they did is they just, they just took the two, you know, they just switched the order of everything and didn't even consider the sketch and the drawing and the geometry associated. The TAs and the graders are under strict orders to ignore entirely this kind of response. And they'll just, they'll just cross it out and and not respond to you any further, <laughs> okay? So, so switching the order of integration requires drawing a picture, right? So you've got to you've got to have rectangles, and you've got to 
show us that you're making a consideration about horizontal rectangles and vertical rectangles, etc. Okay, it's not it's not just it's not as simple as just rewriting these in the opposite order. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so the last thing I want to do <coughs> is <coughs> this one. Okay, and we have just a few minutes, but that's all I need. <coughs> okay. So I want you to find the area bounded by y is 4x minus x squared, y is 0, and y is negative 3x plus 6. Okay, and because we're running low on time, rather than lead this through you by the hand, le lead this, lead you through this by the hand. I'll just do it quickly. Okay, so then notice that this this thing is a parabola. It can be factored quite easily into what x multiplied by four minus x, so that it has two roots, zero and four. Okay, in particular, because this parabola has a negative leading coefficient, it opens which direction? Downward. Okay, this is the x-axis, y equal to 0 is the x-axis, and y is negative 3x plus 6, well, that's a line and it slopes downward. Okay, so then, altogether, this picture looks like so. Okay, so we have some parabola. And it opens down. Okay, and we have a line that slopes down, like so. <coughs> okay, so the area bounded by mm, these things. Is that what it says? So, okay, so it needs to be, I see. So I need to be a little more specific in order to make it unique. So it needs to be, the area bounded by this, it has to be below the parabola and above the line. Okay, so then now, how about this region over here that I'm indicating with my pointer? Is that above the line? No, that's below the line. So what, what area is it that I'm referring to? This one. This one. So now, this, this region here is neither vertically simple nor horizontally simple. It's neither one of them. And the purpose of this example is to show you that sometimes the region that I give you will be neither vertically simple nor horizontally simple, but, but it can be decomposed into two regions, each of which is either horizontally or vertically simple. So specifically, this one, we're going to decompose it into two regions, and they're both uh, horizontally or vertically simple. Specifically, right here, I can say, okay, with this green line splitting, I can say that, well, this can be the sum of two areas, the sum of two different areas, both of which are simple. Okay, so then specifically, I'm going to make them vertically simple. So then now, in the first region, here is, an, here is the prototype rectangle. And in the second region, here is the prototype rectangle. So then now I'm about to tell you what the significance of having to do this is. So these two regions are fundamentally different because of the following. In the right region, Right? If I have selected this particular rectangle, do I need to integrate down here? You know, way down here? No, I don't, I don't need to be integrating down here. Okay, so I'm not integrating, not integrating, not integrating, and then I start integrating where? At y is 0. And then I integrate, 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 and stop here 
at the parabola. Right? So I start integrating at the horizontal line, stop integrating at the parabola. Now, that the case is different in the left region. Do you start integrating at this horizontal line in the left region? No, you start integrating at this sloped line in the left region. So you start integrating at the sloped line, you integrate, 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 and stop at the parabola. So what does that mean? How many integrals is it going to take to encode the area of this region? Two. Right, two integrals. Right, one for the left region, one for the right region. So then, let's write down what those integrals are. So as it turns out, you could very carefully determine that this horizontal line is two and that the other one is one. And this is four. So you could figure that out by solving some equations. So then, for the first region, it will be the integral from x is 1 to x is 2, and then integral from y is something to y is something. So what are the somethings? So geometrically, you can see it's from the sloped line to the parabola. So it will be from negative 3x plus 6, and then 4x minus x squared, and then dy dx. Okay, so that's for the left region. And then for the right region, it will be the integral from x is something to x is something. So what are those somethings? 2 to 4. And then it will be from y is something to y is something. What are those somethings? 0 to 4x minus x squared. And then dy dx. And this is for the right region. Okay, so then the last things I want to say are these, is that the purpose of this example is for me to demonstrate to you that I can and will give you regions that need to be decomposed into two or more simple regions. The second one is that it is a frequent game for me to say, here's a region, and I'm not going to tell you how I want you to integrate it. You can do it horizontally or vertically. But I will have arranged matters so that one of them is quite easy and the other one is very difficult or even impossible. Okay, so then you're just going, until you get accustomed to looking at it, you're just going to have to try both, right? So if you find yourself integrating a region and you think, I'm not sure this is possible to do horizontally, you may be right. right? You may be right, okay? And you should try to do it the other way. <coughs> See you next week. Thank <laughs> you.